the trajectory of Greek society in our contemporary world would command our attention if only for the reason that Greece, after all, was the launching pad of what became the full-blown and the mature philosophy and policy of American expansionism. Confronted with the Greek crisis, the so-called Greek crisis of March of 1947, American policymakers, for the first time, gathered together all of those formidable instruments of dominion, economic aid, military intervention, the very frenetic and mystifying ideology of anti-communism, which they had already deployed, but in a sporadic and scattered way, since the months of the end of the Second World War. And with the Truman Doctrine, those American policymakers managed finally to touch off that strategy of very global expansionism, which, when it had finally run its course, would elevate the power of American money and the power of American arms into the guardians of a conservative world order. And in the process, they would evacuate, uh, for, they would e e evict Great Britain from those bases which she had considered her privileged ones. In the process of doing that, uh, they would militarize the so-called free world against the Soviet Union. In the process of doing that, they would safeguard the ruling classes of that free world against any and every revolutionary threat. And in the process, of course, they would reduce Greece to the status of a neo-colonial satrapy. Now, fundamentally, all of those things are of concern to us, but they only begin to skim the surface of what is our deepest concern. We want to understand what the contemporary world is about, and we want to be able to join and to engage in a struggle in order to rearrange the social arrangements of that world. And in order to do that, we have to understand more than how that world looks through American eyes. We have to understand what the impact of that world is upon the societies that it affects. And consequently, American power is not the question when you deal with Greece and when you're dealing with the Greek population. The case of Greece is a, specially con a special concern to us, not only or even primarily because of its elementary role and circumstantial role in the buttressing of American power and the escalation of American imperialism, but much more because of what that power did to Greek society, about what kind of effect it had, after all, upon the lives of the Greek people. We are concerned fundamentally with that impact of imperialism, how that power, after all, comes to deflect the historical evolution of societies, how that power comes to block off and close off the choices for genuine and fundamental development that the popular struggles of peoples have created and that power which in the final analysis comes to generate a very spurious economic growth which is uneven and which is wildcat and which in the final analysis really simply buttresses the old ruling elites and the foreign investors in those particular countries. It's all of those things that it seems to me fundamental to look at when we talk about Greece in that conjuncture of the Truman Doctrine in 1947. Now, it was in 1967 that there was a gathering of high-level policy makers and of academic intellectuals here in Madison, Wisconsin, at the University of Wisconsin, to celebrate the 20th anniversary of the Truman Doctrine. Or, to put it more precisely, to sing great huzas of praise to 20 years of American paternalism in Greece, which, according to the speakers at that conference of 1947, had guaranteed that Greece would not be troubled by revolutionary threats, had guaranteed that Greece would be founded on democratic foundations, had guaranteed that Greece would go through that economic miracle which would modernize her economy and which would guarantee her prosperity. Now, under any circumstances, as you can well imagine, that particular symposium would have been a very shabby exercise in official apologetics.
But in the context of the time, it was ludicrous. Because barely a week after, those experts on Greece disappeared from Madison, and the symposium was over, a junta of Greek colonels simply seized power in Athens and consequently destroyed that very fragile reed of formal Greek democracy, all with the very tolerant witness of American policymakers sitting in Athens, and hence subjugated the Greek people under a reign of repression, But even if that coup had not come conjuncturally to make the Symposium of 67 perfectly ludicrous, it would not have been the University of Wisconsin's most shining hour. Because the singing of Huzas, after all, to that economic miracle of Greece, bespoke in the best sense, bespoke in the best terms, of a kind of very cynical unconcern about the fundamental difference between development and growth. Or in the worst terms and in the worst light, it bespoke of a very undisguised preference for the modalities of neocolonialism, for those growth models, as academic intellectuals call them, which resembled countries like Greece and South Korea and Brazil and Colombia and Venezuela, where the rich flourish and the poor get poorer and American investments are as safe as you are in your bed. And we know, of course, what the difference between development and growth is. We know what we are talking about when we say fundamental development and when we say superficial economic growth. When we talk about development, we are talking about something social, something revolutionary. It entails, after all, not only the rational expansion of the economy, but the expansion of the economy in all sectors and the distribution of the benefits of that expansion to the popular classes of the society. It entails the devolution of power to those who have been powerless. It entails, after all, the distribution or the the expansion of the economy, not for the manipulation of riches for the few, but for the distribution of those riches to the multitudes. But when we talk about growth, which is detached from and abstracted from that revolutionary project, which is simply grafted upon an old social structure and which does not really revolutionize the basis of the society, when we talk about that kind of growth, it entails, after all, a very uneven, a very disjointed, a very distempered kind of uh, of, uh, economic expansion which affects certain small sectors of the society and leaves many sectors of the society untouched and which distributes the benefits of that growth simply to a very restricted elite of foreign investors and their capitalist allies from the native country itself. Now we know perfectly well that the aggregate overall statistics of Greece in the period between, let us say, 1952 down to 1970 are the basis for talking about that economic miracle, are the basis for all those huzzahs. Because if you take the overall aggregate statistics about the gross national product, you say that in those 18 years of Truman Doctrine democracy in Greece, that the gross national product increased by a, a, an average of 6% per year, which is a respectable rate of growth in anybody's country. But in order to demystify those statistics, in order to get on the road of reality, just stack those statistics about the overall growth of the GNP against another set of figures. And those about the emigration from Greece in those same decades of the 1950s and 60s, about that tremendous exodus of the laboring poor from the country of Greece. Now we know perfectly well 
that the laboring poor do not leave their homeland if they have jobs, if they have opportunity, if they have a decent standard of living. But when we talk about that post-Truman doctrine Greece, we are talking about a society in which the decline of population was absolute and not relative. That the number of people leaving per year was, uh, was advancing faster than the number of births in that society. So that in the years between 1955 and 64, 600,000 poor peasants and unemployed workers who constituted then 7% of a population that was no higher than eight and a half million in the mid 60s, joined that burgeoning army of immigrant workers, of Turks and of Spaniards and of Portuguese and of North Africans and of, of Black Africans, who were, who were composing and comprising that labor force of unskilled workers for the advanced capitalist countries of Europe, like Western Germany or France or Great Britain or the Netherlands or the Scandinavian countries. Now that exodus of workers from the relatively underdeveloped societies of Europe and from the relatively underdeveloped societies of the third world really is something of fundamental importance that you should always keep in mind. In the first place, because it tells you a great deal about the mechanism of exploitation in the advanced capitalist societies of Europe. How it was, after all, that the miracle of West Germany, or the miracle of France, or the miracle of Great Britain from the mid-50s on took place. How it was that their economies expanded, and how it was that their own domestic working classes ascended to positions of skilled jobs, or to positions of white-collar work. And that is because it was all based and founded upon the formation of and the super-exploitation of the this reserve army of immigrant labor, which in the host countries was properly kept under control by police surveillance, by state repression, and certainly by very widely diffused racism. And that exodus is important to us for the second reason, because it tells us a great deal about the strategy of social control in countries like Greece where the ruling classes not only welcomed, but contractually arranged the exodus of their surplus labor in order to prevent those social upsets that would surely be generated by excessive unemployment or by a very low standard of living. But the specific case is Greece. And for Greece, it tells us something fundamental. It enables us, when we think about that huge number of Greeks that had to leave in order to find their livelihood, it enables us to begin to unmask the reality of an economy that was profiteering, that was distorted, but that rode under the roseate colors of economic growth. Because it is literally true in my judgment, that in those 25 years, from 1950 to 75, what developed in Greece under the impact of that American presence was very classically a neo-colonial economy with all of the symptoms of that neo-colonial economy. Uh, so that you have that very large stagnant sector of agriculture which is based and rooted in very small unproductive farms and which does not expand at all in a in the economic in the uh, in the gross in the gross national product so that you have in the second place that very low level of industrial expansion and even that industrial expansion limited to certain restricted growth sectors which were in the hands of foreign investors so that you have in the third place that very characteristic uh, symbol of a, of a neo-colonial society, the growth of a very large parasitical tertiary sector, a sector really where people exist and don't produce anything useful for the society. With Greek agriculture, the picture is very clear. It is that you have, you see, 
In the mid-1960s, 55% of the population still engaged in agriculture. But you have an agriculture that is traditional and backward and stagnant, uh, so that the average size of the parcelized farms that were characteristic of that land tenure structure were no more than three and a half hectares in 1955 and are even less than that in 1975. And what you lack in this so-called economic miracle is any impulse to invest in agriculture, to improve it, to raise the standard of living of that vast population that lives on the land. The state did very little, but you see, in an economy like the one the Americans set in place in Greece, the private sector was all important. And that private sector means the wealth of the mercantile and the shipping and the banking interests of Greece, and they weren't in the slightest interested in investment in agriculture, which couldn't bring them quick profits. And so a whole fundamental sector of the economy lags behind, as it does in neo-colonial economies and we talk about industry and that is fundamental because that goes to the heart of the historic burden of Greece. It goes to the heart of the burden of modern Greek history which is the burden of that vicious cycle of underdevelopment and poverty. You're talking about a country where in the 19th century, until the 1880s, there was no industry beyond the level of artisanship at all. That the little industrialization that developed after the 1880s was in very light industries like textile and mostly with foreign capital. That when you get to a date as late as 1939, that only 10% of the industrial establishments of Greece employ more than five workers. You're talking about terrible backwardness from the point of view of an economy that cannot properly support its people. And so what are you supposed to be doing in an economic miracle if, after all, the Americans are subsidizing so heavily with aid the well-being of the Greek people? That fundamentally, by 1968, industry contributed still no more than 25% to the gross national, to the gross national product. And that the percentage of Greeks who were in the industrial workforce went up very little, from 13% in 1950 to only 14% in 1965. Now we know that the industrialization of Greece, in a sense, took off much more vigorously after 1965. And that for two very good reasons. One, uh, because there was that turn to the right in Greek politics. All of that political stability uh, that was associated uh, with the clobbering of the Papandreou movement by 1965 and with the coup of the colonels. But secondly and fundamental, and that is that that economic expansion in the industrial sector in the past 10 years has been primarily the function of Western capital and especially of American capital and not of indigenous Greek capital so that you get finally a plowing of that very favorable legislation that the Greek parliament passed in 1953 under the aegis of American advice and that was the law that so protected foreign investment in Greece uh, that gave foreign investors all kinds of special tax privileges uh, that told them that they could repatriate their profits and didn't have to pile them back into the Greek economy and so those protective devices are now very attractive after 1965 and so you get, by 1975, something in the nature of three quarters of a billion dollars of outside foreign investment in industry in Greece, not very large to be sure, except in a country like Greece. Because what that does is really to distort the Greek economy. What it does is to make all of those symptoms of neocolonialism.
It means that certain so-called growth sectors, chemicals, petrochemicals, metallurgy, that those expanded on the basis of this investment from foreign sources and became really the modern sector of the economy, which means two things. It means in the first place that you get a very strange kind of juxtaposition a very concentrated enterprise in Greece, which is largely in foreign hands. Great enterprises like Esso Papis or like Pechenet of France. And those enterprises really are the dominant ones in Greek industry. In 1975, eight tenths of one percent of all industrial enterprises, those the very large foreign ones, uh, employ 27% of the labor force, produced 45% of the total of the gross national product from industry. But next to that, all of that plethora of little artisan shops, all of that plethora of a very traditional and backward industry characteristic of the consumer trades in foodstuffs or in textiles or in clothing. And consequently, you get a distorted economy of very, very selective growth and leaving the rest of the economy a backward. And it has a second effect of importance. And that is that foreign investors take their capital out or they do not accelerate the industrial expansion of the country. If, after all, you open an assembly plant because Greek labor is cheap and you market those products elsewhere, all you're doing is renting space and all you're doing is exploiting cheap labor. If you repatriate your profits and use them elsewhere, it does that economy no good. And certainly it does it no good if you invest in those luxury or tourism sectors like building hotels, which so much of foreign capital has been doing of these recent years. So if agriculture is backward and the industrial sector has really not expanded, what is the economic miracle? And add to that, that third symptom of that parasitical sector, that tertiary sector of the economy, so important because so many in Greece work in that tertiary sector. What we're talking about are all of those hangers on of outside capital, all of those hangers on of interior Greek capital in shipping and banking and insurance and, uh, uh, and uh, uh, trade. And consequently, all of those clerks, all of those employees who work in commercial or banking offices, all of them who are involved in advertising, in the media, in all kinds of tourism, in those things that are the expanding sectors of the Greek economy, all of that is parasitical and non-productive. Listen, a great friend of mine who is a Vietnamese and very close to me, came back from six months in Vietnam this year and talked to me very, very candidly about the difficulties in that country now. And one thing that struck me, that Zhao told me that was right to the point, was that to integrate a city like Saigon into anything like an ongoing socialist society or anything like a society that has a rational social formation is hell on wheels. That it is the biggest city in Vietnam and what had happened in those 20 years of war and what had happened in those 10 years of American occupation virtually of Saigon was that everybody was employed to eat nothing that there was no productivity, that nothing was being produced. And consequently, you suddenly got these four billion people and you've got no jobs for them because you simply will not permit them to do the non-productive work on the streets that they were doing with the American occupation. Well, you can begin to understand what we mean by a deformed and a distorted economy, what we mean by neocolonialism, how to say the praises of an economy in which in this very past year the 40% who were lowest in the economic scale gained only 9% of the total national income and only 17% in the upper echelons gained 60% of what was distributed in wealth. 
how to sing the praises of an economic society under the aegis of the Truman Doctrine when the multitudes in Greece have generally the choice of either accepting their lot or going into that exodus of emigration. In the final analysis, the Greek masses have borne the burden of their modern history. A burden made all the more difficult by the presence of American imperialism. A burden which only the revolutionary movement of the 1940s ever tried to remove from the box of those Greek masses. That burden is the vicious cycle of underdevelopment and poverty, and at the heart of the Greek historical crisis is the bankruptcy and the failure of the Greek bourgeoisie to carry through the development of that country in modern history. We are talking about a fantastically interesting historical problem. We are talking about a bourgeoisie which was the ruling class of Greece in the 19th and 20th century and which persistently did not fulfill either its capitalist function or the function of a national bourgeoisie. By its capitalist function, I mean to create the infrastructure and to make the investments for the efflorescence of capitalism, which at least could have provided the jobs, could have provided something of an improvement in standard of living, and most important, could have protected the independence of that country against continuous outside intrusion and outside control, and certainly did not play the role of a so-called national bourgeoisie, if that ever exists in reality, by which we mean that alliance between the bourgeoisie and the popular classes, the willingness on the part of a bourgeoisie to sacrifice enough, to distribute enough of the wealth so that you do expand that consumer market and do enable that economy to grow. And the irony of it all is that of all the underdeveloped countries I know anything about, whether in Europe or the third world, Greece is the only one which before it even attained independence in 1821 from the Turks had a reasonably large and rich bourgeoisie. Because that bourgeoisie emerged already in the 16th century within the framework of the Ottoman rule in Greece. And the Greeks became the great merchants of the Ottoman Empire and they handled after all the trade not only inside that empire, but between it and the growing industrial societies of Western Europe. And so it shouldn't surprise us that in the history of modern Greece, that it is this bourgeoisie living in most instances in the diaspora, in those Greek colonies that were established in the major capitals of Europe, where they were establishing themselves as traders, that it is that Greek bourgeoisie which provided the ideology and indeed the money to wage the war of independence that the Greek people waged against Turkish rule. Now that war of independence began in 1821. It would conclude with the independence of Greece in 1830. And it is touched off, if you please, and is somewhat the handiwork of a secret society, the Feliki Hatairi, the Society of Friends, which is founded in 1814 by Greek merchants, by Greek capitalists living in the diaspora. And they are influenced by the ideals of nationalism and liberalism of the French Revolution. And they are thinking about a modern Greek constitutional liberal society as the cadre for the development of a Greek capitalism. Now granted, it is not the bourgeoisie that fought the wars of independence. They are the people with the ideas, generally. And so the war was fought by the peasantry, 
and especially by those very brave brigands known as the Knecks, who were up in the hills of Greece and who were fighting against Turkish authorities in a tremendous campaign of guerrilla warfare. And finally, that war came to its fruition in 1830. But the promise of establishing a liberal cadre for capitalist development was dashed for two reasons in that 1837 then. One, because you see, most of these uh, Greek capitalists, most of these merchants and shippers lived outside the country in these diaspora colonies and consequently were not close to the center of the state and consequently were mainly concerned about buttressing their profits. But secondly, because from the very beginning of independence, there was the very fine hand of foreign control over Greece. That Greece, after all, on her founding as an independent state, was already the arena of rivalry between Great Britain and France and Russia. And consequently, when they arranged the frontiers of that Greek state, they did it so that Greece should be a small and very weak state. And so Greece was founded in 1831 as an independent monarchy with only 800,000 people leaving two and a half million Greeks unredeemed within the Turkish Empire. But more than that, those foreign powers, and especially the British Foreign Office, imposed upon that little state a very reactionary monarchy. For it's always the idea of the foreign power that they could control the classes inside the society by controlling the monarchy. And so they imposed upon Greece a Bavarian monarchy. The son of Ludwig of Bavaria, named Otto, became the king of Greece in 1831, a reactionary, anti-liberal, taxing the peasants up to the hill, oppressive from every point of view, but infudating Greece to the foreign powers because he ran his government on the basis of loans which he was incessantly contracting with foreign powers and which put the country in his hands. Now there comes to be a change in 1862. There is a crisis in Greek society and that Bavarian monarchy falls and there seems to be an opportunity because you see, from independence until the 1860s, this Greek bourgeoisie did exactly what I said it did, which is to withdraw from any real concern about the development of the country. In fact, to become client to all of those industrial and commercial interests in the great powers that wanted to transport their goods into Greece, to become interested, in other words, in their own development as merchants and as shippers and as bankers and to dream, yes, to dream a little bit about irredentist Greece, about getting back all of those other territories in the Ottoman Empire, but not stay in Greece and really fight through that whole crisis of development. But then you see a crisis did develop, discontents, contradictions, the peasantry, crushed under by taxes, begins to become endemically, endemically uh, hostile to the regime. Revolts begin to take place. Add to that the fact that the army begins to be discontented by the regime itself. It doesn't feel it has opportunity. Add to that the fact that this kind of crisis refurbishes, rekindles the interest of the bourgeoisie in a genuine constitutional society in which they will have a dominating voice. All of that makes a crisis that the British really produce as a finished commodity. Because the British decide they don't like Otto. <laughs> And Otto had sided with the Russians in the Crimean War, and the British had sided with the Turks, and they didn't have to prop up a little Bavarian in Greece to have him turn his back on them. 
And consequently, with the British support, something could be done, a military coup in 1862, and consequently, Otto and the Bavarian monarchy are forced to flee. And so you get another monarchical lie. Now, two things of great interest. That the bourgeoisie in this struggle did not ally with the peasantry. They did not act as a national bourgeoisie. They did not rouse a great national struggle. They waited until the army crushed various peasant revolts. And secondly, that bourgeoisie depended upon the British to make the change in the Greek monarchy. And so the British installed a monarchy much more favorable to the interests of Great Britain, and that the House of Glücksberg, the Danish royal law. And so you now have a Danish king, who is called George I, and who ascends the throne. But he will welcome a constitution, he said. And consequently, there is a constituent assembly in 1864, and it draws up a constitution which the king accepts, and that means that the king will reign and not rule. It means that ministries will be responsible to parliament and all of that palaver of parliamentarianism. But for development, for a national revolution, it didn't work. Because you see, by that time, this Greek bourgeoisie is not acclimated, not habituated to investment in other risky areas than commerce or shipping or banking. And that fundamentally it used the parliament and used that constitutional system simply to feather its own nest. You don't get, you see, in those last decades of the 19th century, authentic political parties that represent ideologies. You don't get a party that says, we must have the capitalist revolution. We must do what the French did in 1789. We must do what the British did in the revolutions of 1640 and 88. What you get are clientels. You get notables who build up local clientels and get themselves elected to parliament, and there they use their personal clout in order to get special favors from the state. In all of those last decades of the 19th century, there is only one effort to put Greece on the road to some kind of development, and that is a total defeat and illustrates the bankruptcy of this ruling class. And it is in the period of Tripukas, it is in a period when, fundamentally, the Greek state is in a terrible state of stagnation. In 1885 comes to the prime ministership, Tripukas, who remains in that office for a decade, until 1895. And Tripukas is a rational, intelligent bourgeois. And he says that Greece cannot go on this way. And what we must do is to begin to plant the infrastructure of another kind of economy. And so he is into a modest program of making paved roads, of expanding railroads. He expands the port of Piraeus to include more shipping. And he establishes tariff walls with the idea that this will encourage bourgeois to invest in Greek industry. And there is a little modest advance, uh, generally in very light industries, pottery, textiles, uh, the processing of olives, and so forth. But the point is that Tricupis was bourgeois, and he could not ally with the popular classes. He could not say, we will make our development on the basis of taxing the rich. We will make our development on the basis of tapping the wealth of Greece. What he did was to base this whole program in purely bourgeois terms upon very heavy taxes, indirect taxes upon the peasantry, taxes on tobacco, taxes on matches, and then to go for foreign loans. 
and the foreign loans were incessant in the decade between 1885 and 1895 until by the time, by the time Tricupas falls for office in 1895, the very interest on the Greek debt to foreign creditors is 40 or 50 percent of the budget. In other words, in this effort at modernizing, Trikupas and that enlightened Greek bourgeoisie had turned the country into the hands of the foreign powers. <coughs> then, a period of 15 years, a period between 1895 and 1909, a period right up to the time that Venizelos bursts upon the scene. And very interesting. There are social mutations in the country. There are discontents that are very deep. And there are, obviously, contradictions that are growing more profound. Look, that in the cities you begin to get the rise of a lesser bourgeoisie. This expansion in trade and shipping and banking this increase in commercial activity has created a lot of employees, white-collar workers, and they added to that whole mass of very small wholesale dealers in Greece and of that mass of petty retail merchants, they constitute a petty bourgeoisie of the cities that is blocked in Greece by the stagnation and by the underdevelopment. Consider in the second place the discontent of a peasantry which begins to do something that peasants aren't supposed to do, begins to get political. <laughs> now this peasantry is in trouble, and it is suffering. And if you think, for example, that in the years between 1901 and 1921, when the population of Greece was only two and a half million in 1901, that in that 20 year period there are 400,000 who emigrate from Greece, a great number of them peasants, 95% of them going to America, desperate to look for some kind of opportunity, you realize that the problem of the land is a serious one. And these peasants then begin to follow an agrarian party. An agrarian party develops and it begins to spread around the word of a moratorium on debts and of break up the few big estates that exist in Thessaly and Epirus. And finally, to reduce taxes so that crushing tax burden doesn't fall on the peasants. And at the same time, in the tiny urban working class, before that First World War, in the first decade of the 20th century, the first trade unions, the first talk of socialism. And even in the army, the younger army officers, and the Greek army on several occasions before 1935 intervened to the left and not to the right. And these younger army officers, forming a secret military society, by 1909, encompassing 500, looking over to Turkey, saying that the Young Turk Revolution was a model, already, in a sense, presaging things like the group around Nasser or the group around Kemal Ataturk. In other words, young army officers who are embarrassed by the backwardness of their country, by how reactionary the monarchy is, by how paralyzed the parliament is. And it is in that context that Eleuterios Venizelos bursts on the scene. And this Venizelos is worth talking about because he tells you everything that is wrong with being a liberal, because he is. But he has a radical club, and that's his problem. He's a Cretan, that is, he's born in Crete. <laughs> <laughs> a revolutionary in his youth, and somebody who is charismatic and very fiery, and who founds an instrument to renovate Greek society, who founds the Liberal Party, and who denounces the backwardness of Greece, and denounces the paralysis of the Greek government and who begins to build up a real support in the popular classes. It was perfectly possible 
for Venezuelans to build up a great populist movement if he had wanted it. Perfectly possible, because he spoke with a radical elan for him to have rallied people to support something they so much wanted, which was the modernization and the development of that country. And so it was that his chance came in 1909, because in May of that year, the secret military league that had been formed by these army officers made a show of force. And they got some reforms inside the army, but they themselves did not want to take power. They called for Venezuelos, and the king, George I, forced to install Electorios Venezuelos as the prime minister. Elections are then held for a new parliament. They are held in 1910. That parliament assembles on the 1st of January of 1911. And of the 364 deputies in the lower chamber, 300 are Venezuelans, are liberals. He can do what he wants. And that is the chance. And will Venezuelans make the national bourgeoisie? And will Venezuelans clear the way for the independence and the capitalist development of Greece? And of course, the effort was a defeat profound. Because there is a lot of talk with Venezuelans. And he did a few things in this parliament that were a big liberal and reformist. There was a law for old age pensions. There was a law for uh, pensions to the sick and to, for accidents in the industry. And then there was a law which said that the constitutional provision that you can never expropriate property must be amended to say that you can expropriate big landed estates with compensation. Sure. But all of that was just on the book. None of it was ever applied. What it meant to do was to defuse the threat of the agrarian party and even the threat of socialism as it began to be talked about in the cities. Basically what Venezuelans did in a productive sense, so far as some people in Greece were concerned, was that he gave opportunity for a new stratum to emerge in public office. Because he really has behind him what Gambetta once called those nouvelles couches sociales, those new social strata, the white color petty bourgeoisie. They now flock into the, the ranks of the Liberal Party. They are the followers of Venezuelos. And for them, there is public office. For them, there is bureaucratic role. In other words, the base of the bourgeois elite broadens. But when it's a question of the central burden of Greek history, when it is a question of the development of that country, then the resolution of Venezuelos is the classic one of imperialism. Because Venezuelos' idea was that all of the problems of Greece would be resolved if Irredentist or Greater Greece could be reconquered. If you could only imperialize and get those territories of the Balkans, those territories of Turkey, in which there were Greeks, to which the Greeks had a claim, then somehow the problem of growth, the problem of prosperity, the problem of happiness would be resolved. And so Venezuelos brings the Greeks into those two Balkan wars of 1912 and 13, and brings it into the First World War. Now all of this is profoundly important, not only because the imperialist resolution of Venezuelos is a complete diversion from the essential problems interior in Greece, but because it really puts Greece in the hands of the British. Because obviously the Greeks are not going to be able to conquer anything anywhere unless the British want them to. And it's only when the British, after all, are anti-Turkey, when they decide that that nationalist movement in Turkey is already a bit threatening, and they get on the anti-Turkish bandwagon, that there is a green light for the Greeks. So it was in World War I, a dilemma. 
The king at the time was Constantine, the son of George I. George had died under assassination in 1913, unmourned and unloved. And consequently, Constantine became the king in 1913, and suddenly came the World War, and he was caught in a dilemma because he was supposed to be pro-British, but his brother-in-law was the Kaiser. And consequently, he supported with Germany, he, he sided with Germany, Venezuelos obviously sided against Germany because Turkey was the ally of Germany in the First World War, and his ambition was to get Asia Minor. And consequently, the king would not take the moves to bring Greece into that First World War. Venezuelos made his contact with the British. In 1916, he formed in Salonika a so-called provisional government, got the funds to put together an army to march on Athens and depose Constantine, force him to abdicate in favor of his eldest son, Alexander, who didn't care. <laughs> and so Venezuelos took Greece into that First World War magnificent. They got the Treaty of Sand. The Greeks did in 1920, which gave them a big chunk of Turkish Asia Minor. Oh, but poor Venezuelans. You see radicals that really are phony, and liberals that run around in radical rhetoric get theirs. <laughs> Venizelos was that this magnificent expedition that he sent into Asia Minor to clobber the Turks when they refused to obey the orders and the articles of the Treaty of Sevres, well, that army got stopped by the Turks because the Turks were already under the inspiration of Kemal Ataturk and a nationalist movement and damn it, they were going to save something of their terrain which had been lopped off consistently and consequently, that army went in in 1920. By 1922, was a total catastrophic defeat for the Greeks. They lost all of Asia Minor, and not only that, but the Greeks who were living there were kicked out by the tens of thousands and had to relocate on the mainland. All of that led to the fall of Venizelos. By the elections of 1920, he fell from office, and it meant that Constantine came back replaced his son, and consequently carried on the war until its defeat. Now the point is, and what is central, is that there is, you see, an instinctive fear, which is characteristic of the so-called national bourgeoisie, an instinctive fear of the masses. And that is at the heart of the crisis, because Venezuelans went as far as any bourgeois liberal would go, in trying to cater to the masses, but always that instinctive fear, never that willingness to really make an alliance. And so it was that he passed as a Republican in the 1920s, opposed to the monarchy, but proved to be a Republican of the most spurious sort. And that important in your understanding of that whole Greek Civil War of the 1940s. Because what happened in brief was this that Venizelos had the reputation of being a Republican because he had opposed the King Constantine in the First World War. And also, because by 1924, a good part of the Liberal Party had come out for a republic. And a republic actually was established in Greece in 1924, which lasted down until November of 1935. In other words, it lasted a period of about 11 years. And the background for that is very simple. And that is that there was great discontent in Greece after the defeat in Asia Minor that the king, Constantine, who had carried on that war, was blamed for it. And there was a military coup led by General Pastiras in 1922, and Constantine forced to abdicate in favor of his son, not Alexander this time, who had died having been bitten by a monkey. <laughs> Replaced by his second son at this particular time, who goes by the name of George II. But by that time, there is in the country a tremendous amount of social ferment beginning. Remember that the Greek Communist Party was founded in 1920. 
and that in a country that had no strong uh, socialist tradition, uh, that that Communist Party was going to uh, pick up strength, especially in Macedonia, in a city like Salonika, among the tobacco workers, among the uh, among the exploited workforce uh, of what there was of industry, uh, so that by 1926 the Communists would even in the elections put ten Communists into uh, the lower house of the Greek Parliament. All of that meant that there is social ferment. Uh, there are peasant and worker elements. There are young army elements that want not only a republic, but that want a refurbished society. And consequently, in the elections of December of 1923, uh, it is a great victory uh, for the liberal party that claims that it will install a republic. And that parliament, uh, when it meets in March of 1924, uh, deposes uh, the king, uh, sends him into exile, uh, proclaims the republic. Uh, in the next month, in April, uh, there is a national plebiscite, and 69% uh, of the Greek population uh, supports uh, the installation of a republic. It's at that point, you see, uh, that you see Venizelos in his true colors, uh, because he had claimed to be for the republic simply because he wanted it to be the cutoff point, the end of the whole movement. In other words, it was to defuse perspectives and to defuse programs that were coming from the popular classes that already uh, might be too radical. And this elder Venizelos gets into office again as the Prime Minister in 1928. And he rams through a very repressive law in the beginning of 29 aimed at the Communist Party, uh, saying that any party uh, that preaches the uh, overthrow of the social order is culpable uh, to long prison sentence. And the next year, he begins an attack upon the students uh, in the universities and in the secondary schools uh, because as the depression is developing, uh, they are be beginning to uh, manifest and they are beginning to demonstrate. And so the regulations uh, governing entry into the secondary schools become so difficult that between 1929 and 33, uh, the number of students in those schools uh, is cut in half. Uh, you see the point. Uh, the Depression comes. Venizelos in no way uh, will touch uh, the prerogatives of Greek property. In no way uh, will he touch the prerogatives of the Greek bourgeoisie. And consequently, he rattles through uh, those early years of the Depression, uh, not on the basis of taxing the rich in order to give something to the suffering Greek masses, uh, but by borrowing money uh, once again, especially uh, from uh, the British banking system. They're fed up, the Greeks. They're fed up. And they go to the elections of 1933, and they pat it with this Venezuela. So they finally pulled his plug out. And he'd gone a long time mystifying them, as liberals do. And so they went to the elections in March of 1933, and they voted for the other party. That, you see, was their mistake. You never just vote for the other party. <laughs> they, voted for <laughs> they voted for somebody called Tsardaris, and he headed something called the Populist Party. And he was pure reactionary, and he wanted the king back. And he became the prime minister in Tsardaris in 1933 and began a terrific repression, a purge of the bureaucracy, of the faculties of the schools, and especially of the army, of all supposed left-wing elements, all Republican elements. It's the period when the army becomes thoroughly reactionary in Greece. And that isn't even enough for the senior officers in the army who are now really royalist and really to the right. And consequently, in 1935, they forced Saldaris out. They put one of their own generals in, and he says, the king will come back. George had been living up there in London, of course. And consequently, George II is invited back by the government, and there is a plebiscite that the army runs, and 98% say yes, they want the king back, <laughs> and he arrives back in December of 1935. And you see, you begin the tragedy of the Greek people there. 
you are at the beginning of 1936. There is social turmoil all through the first six months of that year. 344 strikes, culminating in that strike in Salonika on the 8th and 9th of May of 1936, where there had been 5,000 tobacco workers out who called out 25,000 others in friendly support, where they clashed for two days with the police, where 12 were killed. There is this kind of social upset in the country. The parliament is sits in January of 1936 after the elections, and there are 143 pro-royalist reactionaries, 142 anti-royalist Republicans, and 15 communists with the swing vote. And the king says there's a paralysis in the country. And he didn't want to go away again. And consequently, in April, on the 21st of April of 1936, he called on the leader of a tiny royalist party in the parliament that had only seven deputies, whose name was General Janos Metaxas. And he called on General Metaxas to take office and to create some order in the country that General Metaxas is, as you know, what the Greeks call fascism, what is the Greek variant of fascism. And that General Matoxis comes to the office of Prime Minister in April of 1936. The Parliament thinks he's there just as a stopgap for a couple of months. It votes an idiotic uh, uh, vote of power to him, tells him that while the Parliament goes on its summer holiday, he can rule by decree. It never came back. There would be no parliament until after the Second World War. And that Matoxis put Greece under the Greek variant of fascism. That the people who had begun to make resolutions, who had begun to have perspectives as an alternative to the bankruptcy of the Greek bourgeoisie, of a ruling class that could never conceive of how Greece should go, they were to be the victims. And so Matoxis and Mandiakis, who was his secret police chief, really imposed a reign of terror. The parties went, the trade unions went, the strikes went, political prisoners swelled the prisons. The communists were not only outlawed, but bludgeoned and tracked and beaten. Women were thrown out of jobs and told to go into the kitchen. Children were put into the variant of the Hitler Jugend, and consequently, fascism had come to Greece. But it was terroristic on a daily basis, and it didn't even have any confidence in itself. And consequently, once that fascism had to confront the problem of participation in a war, would it last? Could it last? And if it didn't, shouldn't the people who were fighting the war, and shouldn't the people who were making the resistance, shouldn't they take their vengeance not only against Nazi occupiers, but against that king who called Matoxis, against that fascist regime, and against that whole bourgeoisie that had failed the Greek masses throughout all of its modern history? August 4th, 1936, a very long night of fascism fell across the popular classes of Greece. It was a terrible interlude, an interlude of repression in which the establishment of Greece wreaked its vengeance upon the laboring poor, arresting and torturing its militants, smashing its independent organizations, and dismantling that structure of formal democracy to which ruling classes have a commitment only so long as they can manipulate its institutions and befog the public. And under the hammer blows of the Great Depression of the 1930s, the fragile Greek economy had suffered terribly. And as a result of that, the popular classes of Greece had begun to do what they weren't supposed to do in Greek history. They had begun to mobilize their forces. They had, become, they had begun to become articulate. 
They had begun implicitly to question whether they ought to remain trapped forever and a day within that vicious cycle of underdevelopment and poverty, which we have named as the central dilemma and the central burden of Greek history. They began to ask the question of whether that long hundred year semi-colonialism to which Greece had been subjected ought to remain and ought to last. Because you see from the beginning, from that 1830 when the great powers had handed to Greece her independence on their terms, the masses of Greek society had paid a very heavy tribute to the profiteers of a semi-colonial regime. And when we say profiteers, we mean certain very precise forces in Greek history. We mean in the first instance British imperialism to be replaced after that resistance movement in 1947 by American imperialism. We mean after all that British foreign office, which throughout 19th and early 20th century Greek history set the terms of Greek politics. We mean those British investors and traders who monopolized the very meager markets of that impoverished country. We mean British colonial policy, uncontested, if you please, after the installation of a pro-British monarchy in 1862 in Greece, that British colonial policy which relegated the country to permanent underdevelopment. And we talk about profiteers and we mean in the second instance that very parasitical monarchy. A monarchy, after all, which was a foreign graft on the Greek body politic. First a Bavarian line, then a Danish line to come to exploit the Greek people. Three times culpable, if you please, for the deformation of Greek history. In the first place, because that monarchy, and especially after the installation of the Danish line in 1862 with George I, that monarchy almost infallibly the conduit of British influence and British imperialism in Greece. That those Greek kings, after all, were protected by and were the puppets of that British foreign office. Culpable in the second place because that succession of kings had no greater interest and no more exalted goal than to ensure the perpetuity of that royal line and to be able to enjoy all of those lavish emoluments which the position of king afforded. And culpable in the third place because in order to reach that goal of perpetuity of that royal line, those kings set themselves persistently against anything that resembled the development of that country, because that economic development would unsettle their British allies and protectors, but even more, because it would upset and would change the social structure of Greece, would expand a proletariat, and would begin to endanger, after all, that ludicrous and parasitical institution of the Greek monarchy, so impudated to imperialism, so impudated to a native plutocracy. And we talk about profiteers. And we talk in the third instance about the Greek army. That Greek army outsized in numbers from the point of view of the size of the Greek population. A Greek army which persistently in the modern history of that country has intervened in politics. Now let it be said that in the early decades of the 20th century, from time to time, the interventions of the Greek army were on what you can call the progressive side. We're talking about the very profound resentments of young army officers who see their country so underdeveloped and stagnant, who see the paralysis of parliaments and of ministries, the profiteering of politicians, and consequently intervene to try to get Greece moving. And so it was in 1909 that the military league, formed as a coalition of some 500 young army officers, did manifest and demonstrate and did force the king to bring onto the political scene Venizelos, who was considered to be a great reformer. And so it was that in the early 1920s, that Greek army frequently stood on the side of a republic figuring that the monarchy was an outworn institution and intervened in 1922 in the so-called coup of General Plastilas in order to evacuate the throne or to get Constantine off it. 
And it was that Greek army that protected the parliament in 1924 when it ended the monarchy, at least for a period of 11 years, and brought on the republic. But it changes. And it changes a decade later in the 1930s. The elections of 1933 had been a reactionary triumph, and it was the populist party that won it. And it was their leader, Tsaldaris, who introduced a very repressive regime into, uh, into Greece, a regime which was going to purge so-called progressives and republicans out of all the state institutions, and especially the army. And so you begin to get, in 1933 to 35 a terrific purge inside that Greek army. And the progressive elements are ousted, and it becomes a reactionary instrument. So much so, as a matter of fact, that not even even Sardaris went fast enough for the reactionary senior army officers, and they put pressure on him in 1935 to resign, and they replaced him with one of their own, General Condilis, and that because they wanted quickly to bring the king back. And the new ministry, really run by the army, invited the king back in 1935 and then rigged that plebiscite of the 3rd of November of 1935 in which presumably the Greek population welcomed an institution which after all had been a parasite on its body from the beginning. And only one more time. In the early 1940s, is there a progressive element that forms inside the Greek army? And that happens in the wake, of course, of the German occupation of Greece and of the beginnings of the resistance movement. And that Greek army had been overwhelmed, as we'll see, by that German invasion. And what was worst of all was that there was treason at the top. And senior army officers really didn't want to resist the German invasion and didn't fight very hard. And were collaborating because they were pro-fascist. And consequently the remnants of that Greek army were taken off the mainland by the British who were there and were transported to Egypt. And that the remnants of the Greek army and the king of course and the, papa and the uh, government in exile to live under the uh, protective eye of Great Britain. And there, inside Egypt, inside those Greek battalions, uh, developed a progressive force uh, that wanted to get rid, finally, of the monarchy, uh, that wanted to uh, reform the army and get rid of those pro-fascist officers, uh, that wanted help to go back to Greece and fight in the resistance movement. And it formed an organization clandestine called ASO, ASO, uh, which meant simply uh, the anti-fascist military union. And that organization three times, in uh, March and July of 43, again in April of 44, uh, tried to make a coup in Egypt uh, to take over the Greek army, uh, to oust the king, uh, to dominate the government in exile, and each time it was countered uh, by another secret organization of reactionary military officers called INA, ENA, and that organization uh, blocked these efforts eventually, of course. It was the British who settled the account. Uh, because the British in no way uh, wanted an army that was going to be a Republican uh, to get rid of a king, which was their conflict into Greek politics, and certainly uh, to begin to revolutionize Greek society. And consequently, the British uh, dissolved uh, the battalions of the Greek army in Egypt. And what they did was to purge out, both at the rank and file level and at the officer level, all of those elements that they considered to be dangerous and sent them off to concentration camps in Egypt. Uh, then reformed uh, the reactionary remnant of the Greek army into what was called the Third Mountain Battalion and sent it off to fight in Italy side by side with the Allies and uh, more important than that, uh, sent it back into Greece uh, to become the most ferocious anti-communist and anti-liberation force army on that unhappy country. The point is that from 1946 on, the Greek army is not in any way progressive. And that when it intervenes, it intervenes under the flag of a frenetic anti-communism. It intervenes in essence uh, to prevent any mobilization of the mass. And we talk about profiteering. 
and we talk about the heavy tribute that the Greek masses have played in history. And of course, at the center of the problem are not any of those institutions as much as the central one, the profiteering of the ruling class, of that Greek bourgeoisie, that Greek bourgeoisie which had been formed even in the period before independence. A Greek bourgeoisie, after all, that had made piles of money in shipping and in commerce in the old Ottoman Empire, but which, once independence came, never charted a strategy for the capitalist development of the country, never stood head against foreign imperialism, never had a program to function like a national bourgeoisie to renovate the country. It is foreign from all of that. It is, if you please, what Francois Partin, when he is talking about those elites, those bourgeois elites of third world societies, calls a lumpic bourgeoisie, <laughs> by which we mean that it vacated to foreign imperialists the terrain of investment and industrialization, by which we mean that it became client to that imperialism, comprador, as we call it, and it simply distributed the goods of that outside economic penetration. And that in the final analysis, that Greek bourgeoisie busied itself with compiling great fortunes in shipping and in trade and in banking, from which the profits came for its very conspicuous consumption, while the Greek masses languished in underdevelopment and poverty. And on the political play, at no point did that Greek bourgeoisie use the framework or the cadre of liberal constitutionalism in order to try to renovate the country or to make a strategy of development. That Greek politics dwindled into a game, into a charade, into a facade of mystification. That what it became was not the play of parties with concise ideologies, it became the play of rival clientele, of parties that simply wanted into parliament or into ministries in order to gain private rewards from the state. The tax policy, which taxed the poor so heavily and did not tax riches. The budgetary policy, which meant that the running of the Greek state was not based upon the conscription of real wealth in that society, but on the infudation of that state constantly to foreign creditors. And the police policy, above all, a constabulary and an army to be called upon, to be brandished against any threat from below. Did it make any difference, the difference between liberal and conservative among Greek bourgeois? Did it make any difference to be in Venizelos' liberal party or in Saldaris' populist party? Any more than it made any difference in the 1950s and 60s to be part of the so-called center party or part of the reactionary radical union party. I was there so often in those years of Karamatlis' regime, those years between 55 and 63, when presumably the reactionaries were in power and those good liberals were out. And I used to sit week after week in the coffee room of the King's Palace Hotel with representatives of that center party. They would talk to any American because the embassy wouldn't talk to them. And consequently, since the American diplomats weren't, I substituted, I talked to the center. And I said, you are liberals, how do you differ? And they said, what they said was, we're not in office. <laughs> <laughs> and so did it make any difference, for example, that a Venezuelos, with all of that mass support that he had in 1909, suddenly burst onto the political scene? You see, we have talked about the case of Venezuelos, the prototypical case to understand something about the Greek bourgeoisie and about its political bankruptcy. And it is important because it tells us that when the chips are down, when the crunch comes, that the ruling class, no matter what its tactical divisions or differences, 
unites to safeguard the system and ultimately will brandish the same weapons, the army and the police, and of course, and of course, the tricked elections and the repression, finally. All of those weapons available to both sides in the Greek political struggle. Oh, Venezuela, a Republican. And it is true that the Liberal Party engineered the Republic in 1924. But did they engineer it for a renovation? Or because it was the easiest way, the cheapest way, the exile of the king for several years to mute that kind and muzzle, that kind of popular movement that had begun to burgeon. For what did Venizelos do with that republic when he came back into office as the prime minister in those very critical years of between 1928 and 33, when after all the depression was descending upon the country? And so he used the power of the state to repress the nascent communist movement. And so he used the power of the state to suppress the agitation among students. And so he ran the state, uh, not by a fiscal policy that was progressive, but by infudating Greece even more to those horrible foreign loans. In the final analysis, you see, the only difference between the liberal and the conservative, the only liberal between Venezuelos and Saldarins, is that they headed up different orders of patronage that they were exclusive systems of patronage, and that the ins got the jobs, and the outs didn't, and that the ins had the prestige, and the outs did not. And so you see the point, that after all, while the Greek bourgeoisie is tied to the coattails of foreign imperialism, while it makes pots of money in its shipping and commercial activity, and leaves to the others the concern for the development of Greece, the masses have no alternative in Greece except to write another scenario for that country or to accept in perpetuity the entrapment within that cycle of underdevelopment and poverty. And that is what the resistance and the civil war is about. It is about the effort to write another scenario. And you see the depression had clobbered Greece. And it is true that the peasantry suffered terribly. Because if that peasantry lives on little parcelized land, if it has an underdeveloped technology, that doesn't mean that the Greek peasantry isn't in market farming. Because it has to sell its produce. And you know very well that in the world depression, the market in agricultural stuffs collapsed and the prices went way down. But for Greek peasants, it was even worse because they didn't produce basic grain stuffs. They produced agricultural commodities that are either luxury or semi-luxury. We're talking about the olive, about olive oil. We're talking about the grape. We're talking about tobacco. You don't live on those things. You may enjoy life with them, but you don't live on them. And the market collapsed. And the Greek peasantry lived in a hunger zone. And agitation became endemic in the villages. And even communism spread into rural areas. And in the cities, it was even more classic that the small proletariat suffered unemployment and suffered cut wages and began to mobilize its forces a small proletariat capable in the first six months of 1936 of 344 strikes, of making unions that began to be larger and burgeoning unions. And in the context of all of this agitation, yes, there is the Greek Communist Party. And that Communist Party writes a history it writes a chapter in militancy because, you see, it functions in the most inhospitable clime. That the working class is very small in Greece. That the repression of the state is continual. 
that it is beholden to a common turn from which it gets a line that forces it either into opportunism or ultra-sectarianism. And yet that Greek Communist Party made its way in the 1920s and early 30s. And so you find it beginning to cede its influence among the workers in the Salonika area in Macedonia, among the tobacco and textile and railroad workers. And so you see it beginning to penetrate into the villages of the Peloponnese. And so you see it beginning in Athens to accommodate to the needs of very impoverished, poor civil servants. And so you see intellectuals beginning to come into that party. And a windfall in the 1920s, a million Greek refugees from Asia Minor, a poverty stricken when they arrive, and who accommodate themselves frequently to the message of the Communist Party. What had restricted communism very severely over those years was a policy line of the common turn, which was adopted by the party and had to do with the national minorities of Greece. Specifically, it had to do with Macedonia and Thrace, those provinces in which there were sizable Slavic minorities. And so the national liberation line of the common turn was that the, those provinces should have the right of self-determination and that those people should even be able to separate themselves from Greece, and you know what that means, in a country which has been fed the propaganda of national greatness and of national aspiration, uh, so that all of the enemy parties, all of the enemy groups of the communists, could call them anti-patriot and anti-national, uh, that they wanted to give up those magnificent provinces of Macedonia and Thrace. And that, you see, changed for them by 1935, in part uh, because it no longer was an issue. Uh, that is to say those provinces had become Hellenized. Uh, the million refugees who had come into Greece uh, began to settle in Macedonia and Thrace uh, to make the balance so predominantly Greek uh, that it no longer really was much of a problem. And uh, besides that, uh, the party line changed in 1935. It is after the Seventh World Congress. It is after the Congress that, that begins to chart the way of the popular front. And consequently, for the Greek communists, it means uh, that they must extend their hand uh, to the petty bourgeoisie. They must not offend national sensibilities. Uh, the line changes then, and it becomes simply equality of rights uh, for national minorities and not the right of self-determination and autonomy. And that more flexible line, the shift in the line, is attributable to the young man who becomes the party secretary of the Greek Communist Party in 1934 and is so intertwined with its destinies, Nikos Zachariadis. And Zachariadis, a young man, takes over in... <laughs> uh, takes over in 1934, applies the more flexible line, really addresses the Greek Communist Party to ranks outside of just sectarian working class ranks. Look, the results are impressive for that little party in the elections of January of 1936 because the Communist Party then has 6% of the vote and elects 16 deputies, and that doesn't begin to tell the influence in working class ranks precisely and in a city like Athens. But 6% of the vote and 16 deputies, it's not really a revolution. And the revolution really isn't on the horizon. But if you are in a very, very vulnerable ruling class, it is. And consequently, what the real issue was, was that the masses had become articulate. And consequently, it began to panic the ruling classes of Greece. And the king himself, George II, especially panicked. He'd spent 11 years up there in exile in England and wanted to hang on to that throne. And consequently, what the king decided was that the Greeks needed a strong leader, some kind of prime minister who would keep law and order. 
Here was this Danish import who was really telling the Greeks what they needed. And so it was that he looked around and he found a general, General Janos Metaxas. That Metaxas who had no staying power from the point of view of a political base. He was the head of a tiny little royalist party in the parliament that had only seven deputies. But he commended himself to the king. He was ultra-royalist. He was reactionary. He was parvenu, you see. He came from a petty bourgeois family and loved royalty. <laughs> and would serve it. And had been a very active part of those purges in the Greek army between 1933 and 1935. And so it was that the king on the 21st of April of 1936, without asking the heads of the populist or the liberal parties, brought on the toxis to be the prime minister. And what is so interesting to us is that the heads of those parties and no prominent spokesman for them protested. And Metoxas came on as the prime minister and already saw a communist coup in the making. Because you see the working class movement continued to crest. And by May of 1936 it reached a violent point. Because in early May, 5,000 tobacco workers in the city of Salonika went out on strike. And 30,000 other workers went off the job in friendly support of them. And those 35,000 Greek workers in the city of Salonika on the 9th and 10th of May had a bloody clash with the police, which left 10 of their number dead. And now the state began to crack down. And so a law was pushed through, which uh, made compulsory arbitration the rule, and outlawed strikes. And then the Communist Party of Greece decided to call a great general strike for the 5th of August of 1936. A general strike of all workers to protest this compulsory arbitration and this ban on strikes. And Metoxas went to the king, and he said what the communists are pulling off, a general strike for the 5th of August, will be the revolution. The king didn't need much persuading. And so he signed on the 4th of August of 1936 that very fatal decree that bestowed into the hands of General Metoxas full and dictatorial powers to cope with the threat to national security. And within hours, Metoxas had issued a proclamation that warned the masses of Greece that those marvelous days of screaming and of acting were over and that the long night of somnolence and of obedience had begun. Because in that order of the 4th of August of 36 we read, I have assumed the powers necessary to face up to the communist danger and I have no intention of giving them up until we have clean communism out of the country, the Greek press, as well as every citizen, will have to submit to strict national discipline. For the foreseeable future, there will be no elections. For dead parties, there will no longer be parties in Greece. The old parliamentary system is dead forever. And so within weeks of that installation of the dictatorship, against which none of the bourgeois parties protested, the axe came down. And so it was that the Chamber of Deputies was dissolved. And so it was that the Constitution was scrapped. And so it was that the press was muzzled and all parties were dissolved. And so it was that a minister of the interior named Maniaki, Ma uh, 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 Maniaki created a secret police modeled on that of the Gestapo, in which all of the activities, political and social, of the Greek masses were stopped. And so the prisons began to bulge with political prisoners. And so torture became a mode of interrogation. And the communists suffered the most. And there were 90,000 who were considered communists or communist sympathizers who were sent off to jail or sent off into exile and leaders tortured in the process. But it didn't stop there. 
Because you see, once you begin repressing, you repress even those within the same structure of the ruling class. And so leaders of the liberal factions were also put into prison and sent into exile. You see, the conflict wasn't a conflict of long-term strategy. The conflict was over tactics. Liberals are much more refined. And so it was that George Papandreou, for example, who would become the head of that liberation government that the British installed in 1944, was sent into exile. A very long night of repression. And during that long night of repression, it should be noted that the depression got worse and that the economic crisis was in no way resolved, that the Montaxis government had no strategy for that, and that consequently it was not only terror and apathy and fear, but it was also hunger and poverty that struck the Greek masses. Now you must understand that, because you must understand that when the Greeks came into the resistance movement, they had just come off their own fascism. And consequently, in that resistance movement, quite obviously, they would struggle not only against the German occupation, but they would struggle against their own ruling classes that had subjugated them to that, the Metaxist regime critically important to understand the real and the potential radicalism of that resistance movement. Poor Matanzas. What did he mean in the final analysis was the imperialistic ambition of his fascist friends. Because he wanted to make friends, this little Greek dictator, with the big ones with the fascists in Italy and in Germany, and he made friendly gestures to them, which they generally ignored. And came 1939, and the European war began, and poor Metaxas tore between the traditional Greek allegiance to Great Britain and his own preference for the Axis powers. And Maniadakis, the Minister of the Interior, so much the friend of the Americans in their period of occupation, issued the order that the press was to make no unfriendly comments about fascist Italy or about Nazi Germany. But what difference did all of these friendly gestures make when in Rome there was Mussolini and there was the fascist high command looking for places to conquer? Well, you see, poor Mussolini, there were the Germans in 1938 and 9, going from strength to strength, that Berlin had taken over Austria and Czechoslovakia and was about to invade Poland and wasn't even telling the Italians, much less throwing them a bone. And here were the Italians with this crack fascist army an army crowned with laurels in Ethiopia in 1935. And that had presumably fought very well in Spain against the loyalists. But then you see the 28th March of 1939, and Franco enters Madrid. There's no need for an Italian army there any longer. A crack army, imperialist ambitions, and no place to conquer. Oh no. Mussolini and the fascist high command look around and they target Albania. <laughs> because Albania won't fight back. And Albania has oil and it is a launching pad into Greece. And so without telling Germany, who didn't tell them anything, the Italian fascists invaded Albania on the 7th of April of 1939 and within quick days had conquered that poor country. And so there is an Italian army sitting on the Greek frontier. Now that should have warned Metaxas and the Greek government that they were next. But you see you are dealing with ideological myopia. And consequently, this is Metaxas and his government who are saying the real threat to Greece is a Russian invasion. <laughs> it is General Papagos 
the head of the Greek army, who says in February 1940, we have nothing to fear from the Italians, only the Russians. And so there is no real mobilization against the Italians. The only mobilization through 1939 is to send a battalion into Crete to prevent the British from landing there in case there is an Italian invasion. And Mussolini looking for places. And so he enters the Second World War in July of 1940 to fight in southern France, but the Germans had already knocked out France. The war ended within a few days. And so there were other places to conquer. And the intelligence reports that came in from the Italians in Greece to Rome said that Greece was really viable for conquest, that the morale of the army was low, that it was ill-equipped, that army, uh, that, the, that the Prime Minister had done nothing to mobilize that army, and more than that, that if the Italians conquered Greece, they had a launching pad to Egypt, and consequently to strike at the jugular of Great Britain. And so it was that poor Metaxas, at home in bed, at 3 a.m., on the 28th of October of 1940, visited by the Italian ambassador in his boudoir. <laughs> and the Italian ambassador hands him an ultimatum to be answered in three hours. And the ultimatum says that the Italian army is to be permitted to occupy critical and crucial military points in Greece, which if read carefully meant to occupy the country. <laughs> three hours. Poor Metaxas. Who knows what he would have done? Two hours passed, and the Italian army invaded. They didn't even wait. <laughs> and who could have thought of anything but a Greek defeat? You are dealing with 26 Italian divisions against 15 Greek divisions. You are dealing with air power of the Italians far greater than anything the Greeks had. You are dealing with the nourishment and the clothing of Italian soldiers much better for enduring that northern Greek winter. And yet, and yet, that from the 28th of October of 1940 until the 25th of March of 1941, the miracle of the Greco-Italian War took place. Because the Greek soldier dug in, held the Italian back, pushed him back little by little until by the 25th of March of 1941, the Italians had not only been driven back to the Albanian frontier, but 60 kilometers inside that frontier. And Italy knocked out of that war by Greece. And how can you understand that? Unless you understand that those Greek soldiers who had their own fascism were fighting not only against an Italian army, but were fighting against a system which had degraded and dehumanized them. And wasn't there for a minute in Greece a flame of hope that flickered bright? Because not only was that Italian army defeated, but in the course of it, Metaxas died. Died on the 29th of January of 1941. Was that not? The new beginning for Greece. Oh, it flickered and died in a minute, that flick. Because quite obviously the Germans couldn't permit that first defeat of the Axis powers by a resisting force. And consequently they would have to come in and pick up the pieces and redress the balance for those Italians. And more than that, the Nazis were beginning to plan their invasion of the Soviet Union and consequently had to secure their southern flank, which meant that they would have to penetrate the Balkans. No, it was curtains for the Greeks. Because on the 6th of April of 1941, cracked German army simultaneously invaded Yugoslavia and Greece. And this was no contest. Because the Germans sent in a powerful force, 11 divisions, uh, headed by a crack, uh, by a crack uh, officer corps, against which the Greeks could muster only two British divisions that the British had sent, mainly Australians and New Zealanders, and five Greek divisions left after the Italian War 
And besides that, the generals weren't interested, most of them, in fighting the Nazis, but in making an accommodation. And it was just a matter of weeks. And so it was that by the 27th of April of 1941, the Germans entered and occupied Athens. At that point, the British who were left in that Greek campaign organized the departure of the Greek army from the mainland so that it could be preserved for a later fight. And so 57,000 troops, plus the king, plus a government in exile, transported off to Egypt the 11th of May, 1941, the entire country is under Nazi occupation. It was a crisis of tragic proportions for the Greeks. And it was an occupation which meant 300,000 occupying troops who were Germans, who were Italians, and who were Bulgarians. It meant the setting up of a puppet government of Quislings by the Nazis. And everywhere that the Greeks look, those Athenians in their city after the 27th of, of, of April were all of those signs of arrogance, those signs of conquest. Over the Acropolis flew the swastika. A tragedy but not in the classical Greek sense of tragedy, which says that you accept it as fate. Because for these Greeks there was latent revolt from the beginning. Latent revolt not only because they remembered so well their struggle against the Italians, not only because they remembered their own fascist experience, but because they insisted now that they would not submit to this permanent fascist exploitation. And the Greek resistance teaches us something important. It teaches us that the way to say no to fascism is to say no. And that is the lesson of that night of the 30th and 31st of May of 1941 that first symbolic act of the resistance. Because on the morning of the 31st of May, Athenians woke up to something astonishing. Over the Acropolis, the swastika was gone. And obviously the Germans hadn't taken it down. <laughs> and so the Greeks pulled it down. But who? And was it really a resistance? Well, yes! because all of the walls of Athens were then placarded by the words of the German high command, warning the Athenians not to make this kind of resistance that they would suffer real retribution. And a terrible, terrible inquiry was undertaken. People tortured to tell who had done this, and the Germans never found out. But we know. We know that on that night, that swastika was pulled down by those first two lazy stars. Two young men, 25 years old, both of them students. One called Santas, the other called Glazos. And they told their story openly in March of 1945, after all of that was over, in a communist newspaper, in which they said that it went like this that they were walking around Athens on that day of the 30th of May. And it was hell to bear. And the radio was blaring out Nazi propaganda. And the puppet government was issuing pro-German resolutions. And everywhere there was that sign of defeat. And they walked past the Acropolis, and suddenly they saw that swastika. And the two of them, without even exchanging words, knew that that's what they had to do. And so they split in that afternoon, and they came back together much later that night, and they had as their tools only a single flashlight. And they walked through the old placa, and finally waited until it got good and dark. And unfortunately for them, one of the brightest moonlit nights of the spring. And they got then to the Acropolis, already ringed in with barbed wire. And on the inside of the grounds, Nazi sentries everywhere.
And they went under the barbed wire. And they kept diverting sentries by throwing stones in other directions uh, so that they didn't walk in the right places. They finally got to the place where the flag was mounted. And three times they tried to pull it down by getting those metalized ropes to move. And they couldn't budge the ropes until Glazos, finally with an energy that you find in those things, climbed the pole and got to the top and lunged and lunged and ripped the swastika off and came down and they tore it in two and rolled it up and put it in back sacks and went out into the street to go home. And it was already 12.10 and Glazos replied, we were at a party and kept late and the patrol let them pass and Glazos reported in that communist newspaper when he recounted this story and it was a party. <laughs> and how do you get, you see, from a symbolic act of that kind to a structured resistance? That becomes the problem. The time span is short, just a question of some months, but the road is very tortuous. The inspiration surely will not come from the old bourgeois parties. Their leaders are either cringing with fear or collaborating or have gone into exile. But the Communist Party, the Communist Party, but we say that the Communist Party had been decimated by metoxis. But you see you are dealing with something unusual and you must understand it for all the resistance movement. That communists have an ideology which drives them, which is after all that belief in the revolution, that belief in communism. And they have also a political practice which enables them to endure persecution because they are habituated in countries like Greece to clandestinity. And so it was that even when those communist chieftains were put into prison by metaxis, they managed to find a way to contact the mass. After the conquest of Albania by the Italians, Zachariadis, sitting in his prison, bombarded Metaxas with letters saying, let us out because we will be mobilizing people for the eventual invasion of Greece by the Italians. Metaxas wouldn't listen. But at a certain point, Metaxas himself gave the communists some leverage with the mass. Because on the 31st of October of 1940, at that particular time, uh, right after the war had begun with the Italians, Zachariadas wrote an open letter to the Greek masses in which he said, all of you should fight. All of you should rally to the war effort, and you should rally under the leadership of the Metoxas government because it's there. The first thing is to defeat the invader. Have no reservations about this. Now, Zachariadis would suffer for having done that years later. Fifteen years later, after the 20th Congress of the Common Turn, uh, or of the uh, uh, Soviet uh, Communist Party, the so-called Destalinization Congress, there was a great attack on Zachariadis for cult of personality in the Greek party, and he was finally expelled. One of the charges against him was that back here in 1940, he had said without reservation, follow the Metoxas government in this struggle. But you see, that error was totally inscribed in Stalin's idea of the popular front, that you work with any element that is willing to fight against the fascist force. What the communists did by that open letter was to make their presence known at a time of the Nazi-Soviet pact when Stalin, after all, was not at all encouraging communists to engage in anti-fascist resistance. And consequently, the communists made that gesture. But uh, evidently, the Toxists didn't let them out of prison, didn't permit them to engage in that kind of struggle. And when the Nazis occupied in May of 1941, all the communist leaders who were in a mainland prisons were turned over to the Nazis. And Zachariadis was sent off to Dachau, spent the entire war there, and never did participate in the resistance. But the thing is that at the beginning of the Nazi occupation, there were in the islands, in those island concentration camps in, uh, in the Aegean, uh, there were a good number of communists who managed to escape their imprisonment. 
And that's really the beginning of the structured resistance. Uh, because those communists who get away from those islands, go back to their native terrain, in Macedonia, in Epirus, in Athens, in Piraeus, wherever, and there they begin certain kinds of activity, the long-range activity to collect weapons. That is primary, to get enough weapons so that you can really uh, confront the invader. And secondly, to do little ad hoc things to make it apparent that the resistance is there. Uh, to, uh, to distribute a clandestine tract, uh, to make a proclamation and to post it on walls, uh, to uh, protect uh, British troops who may have been left behind in Greece, things of this kind. Now, the problem, you see, of a resistance lies in mobilizing people before the sense of defeatism becomes too profound. Uh, mobilizing them before, after all, uh, they are starved into submission uh, to the occupier, uh, before they really run off in a moral degeneracy, which makes them so egoistic that they can't possibly collaborate in a resistance movement. And you see, that was the problem in Greece, because that first occupation winter, uh, the winter of 1941 and 42, was horrendous. When you stop to think that the food cards that the uh, puppet government distributed gave only 200 calories a day in that kind of food distribution, when you stop to think that there was unemployment for workers in the cities unless uh, they consented to be conscripted into slave battalions uh, to work for the occupation, when you stop to think of the hunger that takes off in that first occupation winter, 300,000 Greeks by starvation. Starvation. Then you understand what the problem of holding people together is. And why it is that people prostitute themselves, collaborate. Why it is ultimately that they won't help resistors in trouble. That they have gone too far in the way of their defeat. And so one of the first things that had to be done was just to keep them alive. And if I say 300,000 starved in that first winter, a million would have starved if it had not been for the soup kitchens that were organized in the big cities, outside the city halls, outside the schools, presumably by the municipalities, but no, by a clandestine, secret resistance organization spurred on by the communists, which had been founded on the 27th of September of 1941, called the National Liberation Front that goes under the initial name Eon. And it was Eon that collected the food, Eon that did the daring transport, Eon that distributed the food to those Athenians and those people in other cities and kept them alive. And so it is that by the summer of 1941, the communists begin to structure their resistance. It's a marvelous story, which we have no time for, how up in Salonika, for example, in Macedonia, how the communist escapees got back into that city, began to make contact with workers, how it was finally that they organized the first group of andartes, andartes or partisans, or makiza, and they began to break down Nazi transport, uh, to hijack Nazi trucks, and finally, when the Nazis in the fall of 1941 in that Macedonian area really came down with a terrific repression, reprisal in which they just shot and decimated Greeks at will, then the Andartes took to the hills and through that very bad winter of 41-42 tried to live among the peasantry. Yet, they didn't have the technique yet, you see, and they almost starved to death because the Maoist principle holds about resistance movements and about partisan activities in the hills. And that is that a partisan must live, as Mao put it, like a fish in the water. In other words, he must live in that zone of a peasantry which provides an infrastructure of support for him, which feeds him, which hides him, uh, which turns the enemy in the other direction, and that would come only later. What was important was that down in Athens, a central committee of the Greek Communist Party came together from these escapees. And on the 1st of July of 41, it made its program. And here is a lot of the resistance movement in all of its dilemmas encapsulated. Because the goal is national and social liberation. 
national and social liberation. But national liberation gets stressed well over social liberation. The idea is to build a broad front of resistance that's logical and so forth. But you see, the guys that came together in this first central committee of the resistance movement of the Communist Party, tremendous militants, people like Siantos and so forth, but the point is that they had, and they had contact with the mass, there's no question about it, and they did understand Greece, but they had no sophistication about what the world was. They thought, being communist, that the Soviet Union would always help the Greek Revolution. But more than that, they believed the Atlantic Charter. They believed what Roosevelt and Churchill were talking about, about self-determination of peoples. They had no sense that imperialism wasn't going to let them do the things they wanted to do. So their analysis foundered on their provincialism. Basically, they thought, if you build a resistance movement, and in that resistance movement, you really make a very broad base that the people who participate in it will get radicalized in the struggle. And they weren't so wrong about that. Because you see, by the time Eon, which really was their central organization, their broad front, by the time Eon came to its crest toward the end of the war, it did control four-fifths of the country. It did have a million and a half inscribed in it in a population only five times that number. And these were radicals. And what was that Greek bourgeoisie? It had the national roots. It was always out shipping. <laughs> and consequently, the idea of that kind of transformation was logical, except that others wouldn't permit it. And on that, the whole thing would founder. Eon was founded the 27th of September of 41, by the party, with other small progressive parties, the big bourgeois parties won't go into it, by the trade unions. And in its founding statement, it talks about national and social liberation, but in its proclamation of the 10th of October, it calls for a national resistance. Peasants don't give food to the Nazis. Workers don't work for the Nazis. Resist. And they expect that it will go for national and social liberation. Hand it to the Greek communists. That little handful in July of 41 who foresaw how great that resistance movement could become, but who didn't foresee the opposition to it. Nor did they foresee that even inside Greece, Eggers would be founded, a revival resistance movement under Napoleon Serapas to take the steam, if possible, out of the sails of the earth. But that movement was fantastic, and what they did in the hills, and how life began to change, how wonderful it is when life is in your hands, how wonderful it is when it is a fête quotidienne, when every day is a festival, because you make that day. That happened with Ihan, with that guerrilla movement in the hills, of which we'll talk again. That's working in the wings, working in the wings, of course, the people who are going to reconstruct the world. And it's only if you understand all about that Greek history, and you understand the plot of that outside will, if you understand what a tremendous, tremendous tragedy you are involved in, in this global releasing of the world.